This case is a whole new level of crazy. A loving faithful woman finds a forever lover. However, what she didn't know is that this guy had a dark and violent past. Oh yeah, and he was also a bloody sick and twisted distorted psychopath with a strong urge to kill. And with that being said, get comfortable and relax. This is the horrifying case of Sean Spink and Sarah Pitcher. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you may be in the world right now, hello, my name is Lloyd, and right now, you're watching When Evil Follows. Sarah Pitcher was your typical American country girl from the good old state of Indiana, USA. She was raised in a cute small family with unconditional love from her mother. Sadly, however, when Sarah was born, her father, he, he wasn't present in her life. But her relationship with her mother could only be described as a loving one. As a child, Sarah wasn't one to stand out in a crowd. She wasn't overconfident or loud, but her personality and perception of life was intuitive and well-balanced. Her schooling was fine, she did okay, and she really enjoyed physical sporting activities, and she embraced friendship with others easily. Her hobbies were different from most girls at her own age. She enjoyed knitting, sewing, swimming, painting, art, and photography. Sarah was also a God-fearing child who appreciated everything and everyone in her life. However, growing up into a beautiful woman, Sarah would later come to admit that not having a father figure in her life would have saved her from all of the evil nightmares that were to come. Fast forward 15 years or so, and the date is now the 5th of September. In the year of 2013, Sarah Pitcher is now a grown woman in her mid to late 20s. Her life so far was complete and content, and reaching a stage of maturity, she now felt it was the right time, and she decided to go out and find her forever partner, a God-fearing man, a good man, someone with the same beliefs as her. She knew exactly what type of partner she was looking for, and so she took to online dating. And just after a week or so, she came across a profile that instantly grabbed her attention, and that was Sean Spink, a kind and God-fearing man with similar interests in life as her. They got chatting, and they really liked each other, and soon, they started dating. They also had conversations about their foreseeable future together and what they needed and wanted from each other. And they also had conversations about their past, which is a very natural in getting to know you better process. And that's when Sean told Sarah about his past. He told her that he was married, but caught his wife cheating on him with another man. He realized she was never gonna change and foolishly he beat that man up and left his wife only to end up doing a little bit of jail time for his troubles. In hearing this, Sarah was thinking, well, if that was me, I'd have most probably have done the same thing. Grateful for his honesty, Sarah was now thinking how brave and honest and genuine he actually was, and that he seemed like a really great guy. Sarah accepted his past, and she wanted to move past this, and she solely wanted to focus on just them. And so, that's exactly what she did. The pair instantly hit it off, and soon enough, a great relationship began. Both Sarah and Sean joined the same church, and in their spare time, they enjoyed doing faith work in and around the area. Faith work is when a member of the church do nice and thoughtful tasks for others, like shopping for the elderly, or helping someone as a nice gesture, whilst always bringing the community closer together. And yet, Sarah truly believed that this was it. This was the guy, this was the main man, this, this was the one. And that God had given her this man, the perfect man, for her. And so they both decided it would be a great idea for them to move in together, with the high hopes in starting a wonderful and beautiful life together. Their relationship was strong, built on truth, love, care, patience, and understanding. And they were really happy. 
They enjoyed most things together, watching movies, attending church, going out in the community, helping other people together. Everything just seemed so perfect. One evening, Sarah was on Facebook when, all of a sudden, she came across an article. And it was in that article, she found out that her lover, Sean, had been lying to her all along. And that Sean didn't go to prison for beating anyone up, as he claimed. And that he didn't even find his wife in bed with another person. Oh, no, no, no. She found out that the reason why he was in prison was for actually attacking his wife. Now do bear in mind, Sarah has never seen what a healthy relationship looks like. She claims this is because she never had a father figure in her life. And that she truly didn't know how a man was supposed to treat a woman. Or what they were even supposed to say. But at the same time, Sean was being very supportive. And he wanted to be involved in everything she did. And Sarah really wanted that. She really wanted that special person to be in her life and share everything with him. That special one plus one. But without even realising it, Sean would soon isolate her from everyone in her life. He became controlling, argumentative and quite aggressive in nature. And even though these personality changes were apparent, Sarah naively believed that this was just his way of trying to protect her. Sean and Sarah wanted to spend the rest of their life together, but in order to do that religiously and officially, they wanted to get married in their local church, so they both attended premarital counselling. Now it was during their first counselling session, Sarah put her thoughts and feelings across to the counsellor, as you would expect, but each and every time she spoke, Sean would interrupt her with a solid disagreement. He really didn't allow Sarah to have her own views or thoughts. A clear and obvious sign to the counsellor that something was really wrong within the relationship. And it was just 45 minutes into the first session when the counsellor came straight out with it and told them both to reconsider and not get married. Yeah, that's what she said. That was her professional recommendation. Sean then stood up and went to the toilet. And that's when the counsellor pulled Sarah to one side and said, look, I just... Don't think he's a good person for you to marry. Sarah, shocked and as innocent as a happy police officer, said, um, what do you mean? And that's when the counsellor said, I just don't think you guys are meant to be together. Sean came back from the bathroom, confused and disappointed with the outcome. They both left counselling and never returned. Now, the main reason Sarah went to the counselling in the first place was to find or learn new emotional tools in helping them fix their relationship. And so Sarah truly believed that the counsellor didn't have the rights to say that to him as yet, purely because the counsellor didn't know them both on a personal level. And yeah, they both discarded the counsellor's informative information and advice. And it was just four months later, in the middle of August, the pair got married anyway. Their wedding day went off without a hitch. The weather was perfect and the mood was set. They both looked great together and the day went really swell. Sarah loved Sean and truly believed that getting married in their church would definitely sort things out between them both, giving them a much more solid foundation to start a new family. And just for a while, at least, Sarah's dreams would continue to survive. The relationship was now at the point where Sean would lose his temper and blow up uncontrollably over the slightest thing, demonstrating his anger, temper and pure rage. Sarah wasn't happy either. She wasn't allowed her opinion. She wasn't allowed her own views. She wasn't allowed her friends. And she wasn't able to fix the relationship. And so this one time during a heated argument, Sarah said to him, look, maybe the counsellor was right. Let's... Definitely consider doing our own things and going our own separate ways. And with that, Sean heads into the bathroom and he's in there for quite a long time. Eventually, he steps out the bathroom and Sarah notices blood running down his arm and blood dripping off his fingers onto the floor. Alarmed and somewhat terrified, Sarah says to him, Oh my God, what have you done? What, what did you do? To which Sean said, I've cut myself. And then he walked out the house and drove off in the car. Sarah, concerned and shocked and not really knowing what to do next, 
Call Sean's mother and explains to her exactly what's just happened. Sean's mother quickly said, Sarah, let me stop you there. Just run. It's all I can tell you. You, you need to run. And with that, Sean's mother then just hung up the phone. A strange and uncomfortable situation, leaving Sarah in even more uncontrollable panic. And it was right at that moment in time, old Shawnee boy, he's, um, he's walking back in the house and breaks down in tears, telling Sarah just how sorry he is. And he keeps saying sorry to her over and over and, and over. Sarah sees to his cut. It wasn't very deep, but she cleans him up pretty good. And it was during this emotional moment between the pair, they both decided to give their relationship one last try. Things between them both would be great for one or two months or so, until Sean would become highly jealous over the relationship between Sarah and her mum. One night while visiting her daughter, a row broke out between Sarah's mum and Sean, ending with Sean banning Sarah's mum from entering their home. Now, as you can imagine, this made for many more rows and arguments between Sean and Sarah, and the more fallouts and fights they had, the more violent in nature Sean would act. And after completely flipping his lid, hitting the walls, breaking doors with threats to harm Sarah, he would then retreat down the stairs to the basement where he would spend all his hours. And this kind of went on for quite a while, for like two or three months or so. And it was also around this same time, Sarah had noticed that Sean was spending a lot more time on his mobile phone, much, much more than usual. And this one time when the opportunity arrived, she, uh, you know it, she checked his phone. And guess what she found? She found on his phone a dating app and in the app, she found his profile. And yep, but get this, it was a very specific kind of dating app. Yeah, it was a dating app for married men to cheat with married women. Are you married? Yes. Would you like to cheat? No. <laughs> it's just stupid. Let's enforce cheating in relationships. Let's, let's push an app out there for cheating. Let's do it. And she knew then, right there and then, right there in her head, in her heart, in every fibre of her body, she knew it. She knew that her marriage was completely dead. She did ask Sean about this dating app, to which he said something along the lines of, oh, well, I've, uh, I've never actually used it, so I wouldn't worry about it. But that was just a small part of the problem for Sean, because Sarah wasn't worried about it. She had already accepted that the relationship was dust and by now she was no longer invested. Playing it cool and calm, she secretively packed some clothes of hers into a bag, collected a few family items around the house. She then walked down the stairs leading to the basement to take her spare car keys. And that's when she noticed something really, really quite eerie. Hanging from the wooden ceiling with her name sprayed on it was a black punch bag. So yeah, he'd basically been spending all of his time and for months in that basement, beating the living crap out that punch bag and no doubt imagining that bag to be his wife. Crazy. And yet for Sarah, this was yet another sign that leaving this man was her best choice. She drove to her mother's and stayed with her in the family home. And during her time there, under her mother's protection, Sean was continuously bombarding her cell phone with hundreds of video clips of himself, ripping up photographs of them together, videos of him ripping up all of her clothes, videos of him screaming down the lens, like a complete and total utter psycho. And just really demonstrating how violent and aggressive and angry his temper really is. His bombarding messages at night would be so forthcoming with violent threats and nasty slurs. Sarah would literally have to turn her phone off at night just so she could get a little bit of peace without being interrupted by him. And in the morning, she would wake up and turn her phone on only to receive God knows how many crazy text messages, video messages sent from him. Like this guy was absolutely nothing like the guy she first met or hoped he would turn out to be. Because Sean by now was completely and totally, utterly unhinged. One morning she woke up to find her car completely covered in key scratches 
with the words bitch scratched across the bonnet. And with that, in 2017, after nearly two shitty years of marriage, Sarah files for divorce and moves to Arizona, many, many, many miles away from Sean. She then found a cute apartment and moved in, and even changed her phone number. The next six months of her life were spent on self-development, working on her self-esteem, self-growth, and self-worth. She'd been unable to be herself in such a long time. She needed to learn how to be happy and how to be herself once again, remembering and regaining all of the things she loved doing. She was always a creative person, so it came as no surprise to her mother when Sarah eventually started her own business in photography. And yeah, slowly but surely, Sarah was beginning to get her life back on track. Her photography business gave her new opportunities to meet new people, new friends. And in a short time, people were calling and booking her photography skills for those special occasions. And her photography business was now starting to take off nicely. One afternoon, Sarah received a text message from somebody saying that they would like her to do their engagement photos. It was quite a long hike out to the actual point where they wanted to have their photographs taken at. And so she looked up the location using Google Maps. It was a 43 mile drive out and then another three mile hike on foot from the car and given the fact it was in an awkward location Sarah overbid the job price because Sarah would have to carry all of her equipment out there in the boiling heat and she wasn't a hiker the buying client returned back the message and Sarah was quite shocked and surprised and excited that they accepted her bid offer. However, that same day, and about an hour or so later, Sarah received a text message from the same buyer. And it said, Hey, um, we know your friends and we, we know your husband. Yeah, your, your husband's a really good guy. We, we don't understand why you would want to leave him. And instantly, this triggered a huge red flag. And Sarah kind of knew this... This had to be Sean. So Sarah messaged back straight to the point saying, me leaving, I thought would help him and other people understand that we are no longer together and never will be. Now Sarah truly believed that this was Sean and she just wanted this man out of her life. She wanted him to leave her alone, but Sean just couldn't help himself. Sarah then messaged again saying, you know what? Something's just come up and I can't make the shoot for you guys. I'm, I'm sorry. Sarah then reported the situation to the police. Knowing Sean all too well and the things that he'd done in his past, Sarah wouldn't put it past him to scoop this low and try tricking her into going in the middle of nowhere alone. In fact, Sarah told the police that she believed she came exceptionally close to death because had she would have gone out on this hiking trail three miles from the mountains and God knows how many miles away from the roadside, he would have easily killed her there and left her body where nobody would find it. No lawful action was taken though, as there wasn't enough solid evidence to suggest that this was Sean. And even though the circumstances strongly suggested that something wasn't right, the police did nothing. It was a Saturday evening and Sarah was relaxing on the sofa watching TV when all of a sudden and out the blue, she receives a text message from Sean's phone. Now she knew it was Sean's phone because she saved his number in her phone. Even though it was a new number, it would still identify the caller. And so she picks her phone up to read the text message. The first message came through saying, hello Sarah, how's it going? And as she was reading that, another message comes through saying, I'm so excited to see you. We've got so much to catch up on. Then a third message instantly followed. I've really missed you, and I can't wait for us to start our new life together. Like, Sean was now acting like everything was okay, as if everything was fine, and just really off. Really off and creepy, weird, strange behaviour. Sarah texted him back saying, I'm not interested in being with you. He then replies to that text saying, God has told me it's time for us to get back together. Sarah sends her final message stating that she's got no desire to get back with him and that they're separated and filed for divorce and that she's moved on with her life and that she wishes him all the best and that he needs to do the same with his life. At this point, Sarah felt like he was playing mind games with her, but at the same time, she also had the security in knowing that he didn't know where she lived. And so Sarah believed that she was safe.
It was now the 15th of December in the year of 2018 when Sarah was about to leave her apartment. She opened the door to make her way to the car and just as she opened the door, Sean came from around the corner and sprayed her in the face with a powerful, highly poisonous bug spray. He then pushed her to the floor and climbed on top of her and that's when Sarah started screaming, Sean, Sean, what, what the hell are you doing? What, what are you doing? And it was during this fight, this struggle, Sean said whilst gritting his teeth with his hands firmly gripped around her neck, you dumb bitch, I've been living over the other side of the road watching you for weeks now. Look at you all happy in life, happy without me. Well, if I can't have you, nobody else is having you. Sean then pulls out a knife, a knife that Sarah brought him on their wedding day. He then said, whilst gritting his teeth together and hammer punching her in the face, I'm gonna kill you. You're gonna die today. You're dead already. Your body's going in the case and the case is going in the car and we're driving off the cliff together. And of course, in pure terror, riddled with anxiety and fear, Sarah believed every single word he said. He then pulls out from his pocket a plastic bag in which he puts over Sarah's face and then begins to suffocate her. And it was now, during this struggle, when Sarah felt a sharp pain under her right eye. And that was quickly followed by a loud crack and crunch sound. Fortunately or unfortunately, due to the bag smothering Sarah's face and blocking her sight, she didn't see what Sean had just done. He pushed a four inch knife blade all the way straight into Sarah's right eye socket. At the time, Sarah had no idea of what had just happened, only that she was in excruciating pain and was now desperately fighting for her life. Sean continued his attack, with the bag now completely over Sarah's head. He then pulled the knife out of Sarah's face and threw it across the floor, purely so he could focus all of his strength and energy with both of his hands in suffocating Sarah with this bag. And now Sarah's losing a lot of blood and is feeling weaker and weaker. And as she feels her life slowly being taken away by the hands of her killer, her ex-partner, her husband, who's unable to let her go or live without her, she quickly realizes if she's gonna wanna stay alive, then she's gonna have to play on Sean's emotions. And as a last and desperate attempt to stay alive, she screams out, using the last of the air in her lungs. Sean, I love you. Sean, I love you. I love you, just take me home, I... I wanna go home, Sean. Sean removed the bag from her face and that's when Sarah gasps for air. Sarah on the floor sits up and said in a gentle voice whilst looking at him, you donkey, a private cute nickname they would often use between each other when things were great. She then continues to say, what are we both doing? Look at us, like children. I don't wanna fight with you anymore. Just take me home. I want you to love me and I need you. Convincing him that she's been completely miserable without him and that she still misses him every single day and that she loves him and needs him to love her. Unbelievably, Sean believed her. Like, that's how friggin' delusional this loser is. He stalked her, forced his way into her home, beat the living Jesus out of her, strangled her, suffocated her, stabbed her in the eye, whilst trying his damn bestest to end her life and kill her. And in this guy's empty head, he still actually believes that there's a chance to fix and save his marriage? <laughs> well... <clears throat> no. He then takes her upstairs and makes love to her in the bedroom, which I believe is called rape. Now let's just be honest here. She's not exactly in the position to be able to just say no. Not after what's just happened. And not if she wants to stay alive, at least. And so after Psycho Sean had finished, Sarah tells him to take her out for ice cream, just like they used to do when they started dating. So they're both sat in the car together and Sarah's holding his hand. And as the car pulled up to a slow junction, Sarah saw a group of people on the sidewalk having a discussion. Knowing it's now or never situation, Sarah takes the full opportunity to save her life just one last time. And as fast as she possibly could, and before he could even grab her arm, she opened the door and she ran across the road to the group of people saying, help me, help me, this guy, he's tried to kill me, he's raped me. And with that, Sean drove off down the road.
the police and Sarah would later come to learn that Sean had actually researched online how to kill somebody by stabbing them through the eye. And that the only reason Sarah is alive today is because Sean put the bag over her face and accidentally missed his intended target, forcing the knife blade straight through her facial bone and just under her eye socket. This crazy guy even bought a kill kit and yeah, he planned it all out. And so it really is a miracle that Sarah is alive today. However, due to Sarah's injuries, she can no longer see out of her right eye and has lost 80% feeling in her face. She can't feel anything on her forehead or on the right side of her face. Injuries that will never heal. Her emotional trauma will no doubt also stay with her for life. And as for Sean Spink, well, he was sentenced to serve life in prison for attempted first degree murder. Uh, her ex-husband tried to kill her. A valley woman finally got justice today. Sean Spink was found guilty on a long list of charges, including attempted first-degree murder and sexual assault. And today, he received his sentence. Team 12's Bianca Bono was in court and has the details. Justice was served. Justice Sarah Pitcher has been waiting nearly four years to see. I definitely am relieved. It definitely gives me some peace of mind. Sarah is lucky to be alive. In September of 2018, she was stopped, suffocated, stabbed in the face, and sexually assaulted, all at the hands of Sean Spink, her ex-husband who tracked her from Indiana to Arizona. On Tuesday, he was sentenced to life in prison. I can still hear this crunching of the knife going in my skull. Sarah emotional as she described the physical and mental scars Spink left, including leaving her blind in one eye. I'm afraid for any other woman that comes in contact with him. Spink should have been sentenced last week, but missed the hearing after he tried to assault an officer, surrounded by five MCSO sheriff's deputies in court. I do not have any intentions of staying in Arizona. I'm going to get as far away from Sarah Pitcher. The judge ultimately landing on a life sentence, so Sarah will no longer have to live her life looking over her shoulder. Spink has the possibility of release after 25 years. Sarah, backed by her friends and family, say she'll keep pleading for him to stay behind bars for the rest of his life. I'll be back here in 25 years and, um, you know, tell my story again. And now that this chapter is closed. So much for being a God-fearing man, an evil and extreme example of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Hello there, and thank you for watching another episode of When Evil Follows. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and don't forget to ring the bell. That way, you'll never miss out on any of our amazing up and coming crazy videos, just like this one. And please, don't forget to hit the like button it's an easy and simple way of showing your appreciation. So what do you think to this case? Would you have spotted these red flags straight away? I like to think that most men and women would. And what do you think to online cheating apps? And have you met any crazies from online dating? If so, please share your stories in the comment section below. Guys, I really love reading your thoughts, and as you already know, I respond back to every single one of your comments. So let me know your thoughts about this case, or any dating nightmares that you've experienced in the comment section below. And as I always say, please stay safe, look after yourself, and I'll see you again real soon, the next time, when evil follows. Bye.